told Atante she should just take the whole sermon. And she was like, no, I'm just going to be up there for like five minutes. <laughs> and I was like, Atante, come on. And she was like, no, no, no. And she could have took the whole sermon. But um, the title of this sermon is actually called The King of Peace. The King of Peace. And in our scripture reading um, today, it was Isaiah 9, 6, where Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. He is the ruler of peace. The opposite of stress is peace. And uh, stress kills. I want to invite you to open your Bibles with me to the book of Genesis chapter 13. Genesis chapter 13, and I'm going to abbreviate some of this because I want to kind of get straight to the point here. But in Genesis chapter 13, uh, verses 1 through 3, we're not going to read the whole thing, but I'm going to tell you what happens there. In Genesis chapter 13, Abraham and his nephew Lot are in this situation where their herdsmen are fighting with one another. And Abraham says to Lot, listen, the land is too small for us, so you go one way and you choose and I'll go the other way. And I want you to just notice Genesis 13, and if we can notice very quickly, uh, Genesis 13, verse, verse 8. The Bible says here, And Abraham said, Abraham said unto Lot, Lot, let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before, before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I shall go to the left. And notice verse 10. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. For the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, even like the land, I'm sorry, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves from one another. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward where, everyone? Sodom. Verse 13, but the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Have you ever heard the phrase, the grass looks greener on the other side? Lot looks around, and he notices what he feels is, ah, that would be prime real estate for me. That is what I want. Have you ever made a decision in your life based on how it looked to you? Man, this looks good. This is what I want. This is ideal. Let me tell you. Sometimes that which looks like the Garden of Eden... That which looks like, oh, this is the will of God for me. Sometimes that can be a path that God did not design for you to take. The Bible says there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Sometimes our eyes can deceive us. Sometimes our will can deceive us. Proverbs 12 verse 15, notice what it says. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. And Proverbs 4, 19, Proverbs 4, 19, the way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. Let me ask you, which way is it better to trust? Your way or God's way? God's way. Because listen, your way is going to lead you into troublous situations. Your way is going to lead you to unnecessary stress, to unnecessary heartache. 
How many of us have made decisions where we found ourselves stressed out based upon the decisions we made? When we walk in our ways, we actually separate ourselves from Christ. Just as, as Lot separated from Abraham, when we choose our ways, we separate ourselves from Christ. Jesus himself said in John 14, 6, I am the what? The way, the truth, and the life. And in John 10, verse 1, Jesus said, Anyone who tries to come into my house some other way is a thief and a robber. There is only one way, beloved, and that way is Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to notice Genesis chapter 14. Because Abraham, or, or Lot goes to dwell in Sodom, and then we find the situation unfolding in Genesis chapter 14. I'll begin reading verse 1. It says, And it came to pass in the days... I'm going to read it from the screen. It came to pass in the days of, of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Eleazar, Kelomiar, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations, verse 2, that they made war with Bera, king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Abna, and Shemember, or Shemember, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar. So, you may not have noticed this, but there are nine kings altogether. Four kings versus five kings. And the Bible tells us that this battle unfolds in a place, verse 3. It says, all these were joined together in the vale of Siddim, which is the salt sea. Now, why is this battle important to our, uh, our message this morning? Because if you jump down with me uh, to verse 11 and 12, I want you to notice what happens here. It says, then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. Verse 12 they also took who? Lot, Abraham's brother's son, who dwelt where? In Sodom and his goods and departed. So I want you to catch what's happening here. Lot sees a place that he thinks, this is good territory. This is what I want. This is where I want to dwell. And he goes to dwell near Sodom. What ends up happening is that this great battle unfolds between these nine kings. Four of them are going out to war against five of them. And two of the five kings are the kings of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah, where Lot dwells. And what ends up happening, beloved, is Lot gets taken in this battle. Let me rephrase it this way. Lot gets caught up in this battle between these kings. What kind of kings were these? Were they righteous kings? They were what kind of kings? They were worldly kings. So Lot's decision leads him to get caught up in the battle of worldly kings. I don't know if you caught that. Lot's decision to go against or to, to step outside the will of God leads him to get caught up in worldly conflicts. How often do our own decisions to go against the will of God lead us to get caught up in conflicts that are worldly? Conflicts that lead to stress and lead to anxiety and lead to all these different issues. The Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. But when we make our decision to separate ourselves from God, to go another way, what ends up happening is we get caught up in worldly things. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Be not, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. We get caught up, beloved, in earthly battles, in earthly conflicts, in wars after the flesh. And that is, what, that is one of the most serious things that leads to us being in stressful situations. Anyone know what it's like to be in a stressful situation? 
Anyone know what it's like to be in that stressful situation and wonder, did I bring this stressful situation on myself? Which only amplifies a stressful situation. Which only amplifies your thought of, did I bring this on? And you see this never-ending cycle of stress that is designed to destroy you. It's very interesting. Anyone know, notice that one of these kings, the four kings, was the king of Shinar. Anyone know where Shinar is? Where is it? Babylon. He was the king of Babylon. And I want you to understand this, church, because Babylon, and I'm talking about spiritual Babylon, I'm talking about that end time power, end time Babylon who has as its king Satan, is really out to do nothing but cause you stress. Can anybody testify to that? Satan's goal is to cause you stress. This battle is in some places known as the battle of the nine kings. That sounds like an epic title to me. The battle of the nine kings. Lot got caught up in this battle of the nine kings. And I'm saying that in the same way, you and I, when we separate from Christ, as Lot separated from Abraham, we can get caught up in this battle of nine kings. And I want to suggest to you a a symbolic picture of these nine kings. I'm going to suggest to you that there are nine emotional kings that war over the soul. Those kings are the kings of worry. Stress, fear, anxiety, depression, bitterness, envy, hate, and doubt. When we step away from the will of God and go our own way, when we separate from Christ as Lot separated from Abraham, we allow ourselves to become captive to these emotional kings. Has anyone met any one of these emotional kings? that just seem to dominate your life and rule over you. As Lot was taken captive, so many of us have been taken captive by these emotional kings, these kings that have no mercy on the soul. And that's why I like this verse. Genesis 14, and I want you to notice with me verse 14. In fact, let's go back to verse 13. The Bible says, And there came one that had escaped and told Abram, the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, uh, the Amorite, brother of Eshaw and brother of Anner, and these were confederate with Abram. And when Abram heard, just stop right there. You guys should know me by now. When I read this verse, when Abram heard, look at me right now, guys. When Abram heard, I I like that, guys. I mean, you kind of get this picture of when when, when Abraham hears, what? They have my nephew? When Abraham heard, when God heard, y'all not feeling me. (laughs) When Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive. Now just pause for a second. His brother. Wait a minute. Who is that? Who is Lot to him? But it calls him his. You know, if we would care about one another like that, if we would have that say, no, that's not my nephew, that's my brother. When, when Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed. And that's this is where I just get goosebumps, guys. <laughs> he armed. He's like, no, 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 no. I'm not leaving my brother to be, to be uh, 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 harassed and to be taken by these kings. The Bible says he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his own house and went in pursuit as far as Dan. Notice verse 15. 
In fact, we're going to hold off on verse 15. I want you to turn to Psalm 18, verse 6. If we can get it up on the screen. Psalm 18, verse 6. Psalm 18, verse 6. The Bible says, in my distress. Let me ask you, any of you ever been in distress? Any of you ever been captive to worry or fear or doubt or anxiety or those nine kings we talked about? When you are in that, when you are being uh, tormented by these emotional kings, look at what the Bible says. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He, what? He heard my voice from his temple and my cry came before him even to his ears and what do you think god does when he hears your cry what do you think he does when he hears your suffering when he hears your plea for help he comes isaiah 59 Notice with me verses 16 to 19. Isaiah 59, he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his own arm brought salvation for him and his own righteousness, it sustained him. Verse 17, for he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. Verse 18, according to their deeds, according he will repay. Fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. The coastlands he will fully repay. And notice verse 19. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. Beloved, listen to me. Just as Abraham went after his brother who was in captivity, so Jesus Christ came after us when we fell into sin. All mankind rebelled against God and said, we're going our own way and we're going to do our own thing. And they end up get, we ended up getting ourselves in trouble. But God does not say, well, you made your decision. You made your bed lying in it. He says, I'm coming after you. I will come to find you and to redeem you. This is why in Luke chapter 4, verse 16 through 19, when Jesus comes on his mission, the Bible says, so he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Verse 17, and he was handed the book of the, of the prophet Isaiah. And when he found the, the book, when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Listen carefully. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the broken one hearted and to proclaim liberty to who the captives just as abraham went out to deliver lot from his captive state beloved jesus christ came to this earth to deliver you and i from our captivity genesis 14 back in genesis 14 we're going to start reading from verse 15. Genesis 14, verse 15. The Bible tells us this. Genesis chapter 14 and verse 15. He divided his forces against them by night. He and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. Verse 16. So he brought back all the goods and also brought back his brother Lot and his goods as well as the women and the people. Let me tell you something. In this story of Abraham going after Lot and bringing him back, is a story of the plan of salvation. It is a story of what God desires to do for you and I. It is a story that lets us know that God does not design that we should be captive to anyone. Captive to anything. He comes, beloved, as a man of war. He comes as a man of war. Notice with me Psalm 24. The entire psalm, Psalm 24, is speaking of Jesus leading captives to the kingdom of heaven. And I want you to notice Psalm 24, beginning with verse 1. Psalm 24 and verse 1. Let's see if we can get it up on the screen. 
Psalm 24, verse 1, the Bible says, The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those that dwell therein. Verse 2, He has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. Verse 5. He shall receive the blessing of the, from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, Selah. Now I want you to notice what it says next. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the king of what? Glory shall come in. Let me ask you, who is the king of glory? The king of glory is Jesus. Notice what it says in verse 8. Who is this king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in what? Mighty in what, everyone? Battle. Listen to me. Pause for a second. When Abraham goes out to get his brother, Lot, you realize he's going up against how many kings? He's going up really against four kings because the four have gone to war against the five. But Lot is stuck in the middle of this earthly conflict. But Abraham, he has 300 and something trained servants. Think about that, guys. 300 trained servants are going out to fight against four kings with kingdoms. Don't ask me how it is that Abraham with 300 men go into enemy territory and delivers Lot and his family from these kings. Would you say Abraham was mighty in battle? Would you say that Jesus is mightier than Abraham in battle? Beloved, listen to me. Jesus came to this earth as an army of one. To go up against all the kings of this earth. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in high places. Jesus came as an army of one to deliver you and me. This is why the Bible says that we must fight the good fight of faith. Because Abraham is showing us a picture of Jesus as a man of what? A man of war. A man of war. Now, I'm going somewhere with this because in this same story, come back with me to Genesis chapter 14. And in this same story, Genesis 14, and we're going to look now at verse 17. Genesis chapter 14 and verse 17. Because as Abraham is coming back from this battle, uh, the Bible says something very interesting here. Genesis 14, verse 17, it says, And the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shava, that is the king's valley, after his return from the defeat of Kedlamar and the kings who were with him. And now, now notice verse 18. Then Melchizedek, how many of you ever heard of that name Melchizedek? Melchizedek, king of where? Salem. Brought out bread and wine, he was the priest of God Most High. And you know what happens in the story? He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. Verse 20, And he blessed and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand, and he gave them a tithe of all. Now, who is Melchizedek? Okay, some of you said Jesus. He is not Jesus. He's a type of Jesus. Why is he a type of Jesus? What does the name Melchizedek mean? Well, let me ask this way. Who was Melchizedek? He was king of Salem. What does the word Salem mean? What does it mean? Have you ever heard someone say Salam or Shalom? What is that? Peace. So king of Salem means king of Peace. Now watch this, guys. You have in this story two men. Abraham, who serves as a type of Christ, as a man of... A man of... War. 
And then Melchizedek, who is also a type of Christ, but his name means king of peace. Well, how is that? How is this story that we're reading in the Bible showing Christ as both a man of war, but also king of peace? Remember, peace is the opposite of stress. How is God re- revealing himself as both a man of peace or a man of war, but also a man of peace? I want you to notice with me, Exodus 14, 14, Exodus chapter 14, 14. You turn there. When you get there, just say amen. <coughs> Are you there? Everybody should be there because it's on the screen. I want you to check this out, guys. How is it that, that, that the Lord says, I'm a man of war, but he also presents himself as king of peace? You see it. In Exodus 14, 14, the Bible says, the Lord will do what? Fight for you. And you, what are you supposed to do? What are you supposed to do? Okay, so if, if I give you my Bible to hold, and then I say, hey guys, no matter what happens, don't let, any, don't let go of this Bible. Don't let anyone take this Bible from you. What am I telling you to do? I'm telling you to hold, hold your Bible, right? Hold my Bible. So if I'm holding it, If I'm commanded to hold something, that means do not what? Let it go. God says, listen, here's how this man of war, man of peace thing work. I will do what? Fight for you and your job is to do what? Hold your peace. Hold it. So when we hold our peace, we think, okay, be quiet. We think, all right, just sit back and don't do anything. No, no, hold your peace. Why? Because the devil is trying to do what? Take your peace. And he'll use situations. He'll use people. He'll use whatever he can to take your peace and to exchange it for stress. So Jesus says, listen, I have come into this world to give you peace. My peace. Did he say that? He said, my peace I leave with you. Now, why is he giving us his peace? Because his peace is tried and proved. His peace has been proven. Why? Because he came to this world as the king of peace. And so Satan was like, oh, you're the king of peace? All right, well, I'm going to do everything in my power to what? To steal your peace. I'm going to do everything in my power to stress you out. And so now we begin to see that as Jesus comes to this world, he's coming to this world to redeem us. He's coming at him as a man of war, but his battle weapon, his battle axe is peace. And Satan now realizes if I can steal his peace, then I have him. So you know what happens? We, we, we go to Matthew chapter 4. <clears throat> and we go to Matthew chapter 4, and we read in Matthew chapter 4 that Jesus goes into the wilderness. You remember that story? He goes into the wilderness, and he's there for how long? He's there for 40 days and 40 nights. And let me ask you a question. Are the circumstances dire in these 40 days and 40 nights? Are they? But does Jesus keep his peace in the midst of his dire circumstances? 
So you know what he's showing us? He's saying, listen, my peace is battle-tested peace. That's the peace I'm giving to you. A peace that can withstand dire circumstances around you. How many of you remember when Jesus was on the ship? Remember when that storm came up? And, and, and the Bible says that, that the disciples were on the ship and everyone was terrified and everyone was scared. And Jesus rises from the ship, rises and he says, why are you without faith? He turns to the storm and says what? He says, peace be still. Jesus is telling us that my peace is weather tested peace. That means my peace can last whether the sun is out or whether it's cloudy. How many of you know what it's like when you get up and it's cloudy and you're like, oh, uh, today is a day for depression <laughs> because it is cloudy. Just because it's cloudy, oh, it's going to be a bad day. Jesus says, the peace I give you, the peace I give you is a peace that is weather tested. It, it, it will be consistent whether it's sunny or whether it's cloudy. It'll be consistent whether you're feeling like things are going good or you're feeling like things are not going good. My peace I leave with you. In Mark chapter 6, verse 3 through 6, you need to see this. Mark chapter 6, verses 3 through 6. Jesus is once again tested. And notice these verses. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James? Jo uh, 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 um, jo uh. Go to the next verse, please. I want to get to the... Go to the... Oh, yeah, right here. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own what? country among his own relatives and in his own house verse 5 now he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them let me ask you a question why could jesus not do any mighty works in this place because they did not what <clears throat> they did not believe in him they rejected the messiah can you imagine what it, how many of you know what it's feel like to, to, to feel rejection? You, you know what that's like. You know how our feelings can get when we get, when we sense that we're being rejected. And I want you to imagine Jesus. He is the king of heaven and he comes to earth and he cannot even do many mighty works because the people there are like, yeah, we're not interested. Did Jesus keep his peace even in rejection? Jesus said, the peace I leave for you is a peace that is rejection proof. It's been rejection tried. So whether you're going through good times or bad times, whether the sun is out or it's not, whether, whether uh, you are being rejected or not, my peace that I leave with you is a peace that has withstood all of these issues. Beloved, even in the garden of Gethsemane, you remember Jesus said, my soul is exceeding what? Sorrowful even unto death. And Jesus goes into the garden and he prays. Let me ask you, did Jesus keep his peace in the garden? Come with me. Matthew 26. Matthew 26. You see, beloved, Jesus' peace is a sorrow-tested peace. That's the kind of peace that you and I need. Notice with me Matthew 26, verse 61 to 63. Jesus is now in the midst of, of persecution. He is about to be nailed to the cross. And notice what it says here. They said, this fellow uh, uh, said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. Verse 62. And the high priest arose and said to him, do you answer nothing? What is it that these men testify against you? Verse 63. Man, I knew it. All right. So the, king, the new King James Version says, but Jesus kept his silence. I like the way the KJV puts it. Because it says Jesus held his, what did he hold? His peace. How many of you know what it's like to hold your peace and not let go of it even when you're in the midst of persecution? Beloved, this is what Jesus is offering us. He says, this is the kind of peace that I leave for you. My peace I leave with you. If you allow me to rule in your heart, I will give you this peace. Why? Because I am the king of peace and I've proven it. So if I'm the king of peace, if Jesus is your king, then what should be reigning in your heart? 
Why? Because he's the king of what? He's the king of peace. So Jesus says, listen, I'm leaving you my peace. And the evidence that I am your king is that you live under peace. Do you know the Bible says, know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey? So if you're obeying Jesus, what do you have? Let me, let, me, let me try that again. If you are obeying Jesus, if Jesus is your king and you obey him, what do you have in your heart? Peace. Even when it's stormy? Even when the clouds are out? Even when your friends turn on you? Even when your husband gets you mad? <laughs> even, even when your wife gets you mad? Hold your peace. Everybody say it with me. Hold your peace. Beloved, Satan's trying to take your peace. He's trying to take your peace. He's trying to get you caught up in these nine kings of emotional stress. He's trying to get you so that you let go of your peace. And when you let go of your peace, beloved, you're letting go of Jesus. First Samuel 15, 23 says this, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Let me read that again. Rebellion is is as the sin of witchcraft. Let me ask you a question. How can you rebel against the Prince of Peace? What does it mean to rebel against the Prince of Peace? It means to rebel against peace. Did you catch that just now? To rebel against the king of peace means that you're rebelling against the principle of peace. So what does it mean to rebel against the principle of peace? It means to be under the dominion of stress, anxiety, fear, depression, discard. That's what it means. Now, the Bible says rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Beloved, listen to me. Reject the devil's attempt to cast his spells of depression, anxiety, fear, stress, doubt, hatred. Reject those spells because that's what they are they are spells of the enemy designed to take us out of the arms of the prince of peace it is the enemy's sorcerous attempt to lead you to doubt the power of God to deliver you How many of you have ever been subject to sorcery? Wow. Beloved, I need you to understand that God is calling us to something much greater. He's calling us to something much more powerful. And I'm going to close with this. I know I'm saying I'm going to close with this. And I know you're going to, when you see this, you're going to be like, oh, don't worry. You give me five minutes and I will be done. But you have to see this. Do you want to go your way or God's way? Because God's way leads you to God. Your way leads you to Sodom. Yes? So if I know then that if I choose my way, I'm going to end up in trouble. I'm going to end up under the dominion of these kings, these emotional kings. Then I know that I should choose God's way. So my question is, where is God's way? In the where? In the where? In the where? (laughs) 
If God's way is in a sanctuary, then the sanctuary might contain the very principles I need to help me overcome my issues of stress. So we're going to do this very, very quickly. Listen, you know these six articles of furniture, the altar of sacrifice, there's the laver, there's a table of showbread, there's the altar of incense, there's a candlestick, and there's the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant. Say this very simply to you guys listen the altar of sacrifice what con- was about the principle of self-sacrifice of sacrificing things and i want to say to you simply that we have to learn how to sacrifice stress we have to learn how to lay stress on the enemy negative stress is called distress but there's a thing called positive stress did you know that Positive stress is, is, is called you stress. EU stress. You stress. The, 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 the phrase EU, it means good. Good stress. So, how many of you remember when you were getting married? Were you stressed? How many of you remember when you were getting married? Now, I know why you're saying no. Because you, you were not distressed. You were not distressed, but were you stressed? What kind of stress was it? Good stress. Oh man, I've got all these things, all these things we've got to plan. And oh, I'm stressed, but it's a good stress. Do you know that good stress is actually healthy for you? Good stress, listen to me. You stress, look at you stress is the type of stress that athletes have when they're on the field and there's 20 seconds left in the game or 15 seconds and they look at the situation and there's an excitement because, okay, everything is on the line. They're not like, oh, I'm distressed. They're like, you stress, like, come on, guys, we got to do this. They take a negative situation, but they have a positive outlook on it. And beloved, this is what Jesus had. The reason he was able to defeat stress is because he knew his mission. He knew his purpose. And even when time was running out, he was experiencing not distress, but you stress. I've got a mission to accomplish and I will not fail nor be discouraged. So we've got to learn how to replace distress with you stress slay distress and replace it with you stress i want to share with you something else very quickly because there's something called catastrophizing anyone ever heard of that yeah yeah catastrophizing it is the utter panic that you experience Because you dropped your pen on the ground when you should have had it in your hand. Someone stepped on my shoe. Look at this. What am I going to do now? That's how many of you, how many of you are good catastrophizers? Come on, come on, come on. Come on, you, you. You, let me tell you something. This is serious. Listen, listen, guys. In Daniel chapter 7 and 8, there's a power called the little horn. We know it's a satanic power, but the Bible says of this little horn that he magnified himself. Let me ask you something. What is Satan's job? He magnifies. He makes things appear bigger than they really are. Beloved, we have to learn how to slay stress. We have to learn how to demagnify the situation. What's going to happen now? We, 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 what's What's going to happen? You are sitting in my favorite seat. I am about to have a bad day in church today. We got to stop that. Let's go to the labor very quickly. The labor is about washing away stuff, isn't it? The labor is about Christ coming to wash away our debts. Now, how do you get into debt? <clears throat> how do you get into debt? When you, when you borrow, you get into debt. 
Is that right? When you borrow, you get into debt. You know how many of us are, are in debt to worry because we borrow trouble? Yeah, we got to stop borrowing trouble, guys. <laughs> We got to learn how to wash away that debt. Don't look, look, I'm not, the Bible says sufficient is the problems for today. Don't think about tomorrow. We got to learn how to wash that away. What about the table of showbread? The table of showbread was about the word of God. But the Bible says that, listen, we should talk to ourselves in hymns and, and psalms. Anyone ever heard of self-talk? You know, we talk so much in ourselves, man, you're not good. You're not worth anything. And here's the crazy thing is most of the self-talk we do, we don't even hear it. So we're going out day by day talking this negative self-talk. God says, listen, I want you to talk the word of God. I want you to, to, to concentrate on the word of God. I want you to talk positively, not negatively. What about the candlestick? Many of us love dwelling on the dark side. All we see is the darkness. God says you are the light of the world. You need to start having a positive outlook and not a negative one. God says, listen, I need you to be that light. I need you to, to, to start talking to yourself with my words, not your own self-doubt and all those things. I need you to wash away that, that debt. Wash away that sorrow. Don't borrow that sorrow. It's not yours. Why did you take it upon yourself? I came to take it from you. Why have you taken it upon yourself? You're rebelling against me right now. You're rebelling against me by taking that worry upon yourself. The altar of incense, we got to learn how to keep our mind focused on heavenly things. We got to learn how to keep our minds stayed on Christ. And finally, beloved, the Ark of the Covenant, the Bible tells us great peace. Great peace have they that love thy law. Beloved, listen to me. If you would just consider God's way, it is the secret. It is the secret to slaying your stress. Beloved, it's stress why many of us can't even worship God right. <clears throat> we come to church stressed. We leave church stressed. We allow the sermon to stress us. We allow the pastor to stress us. <laughs> we just... We are stress lovers. Do you know that stress can release? Uh, uh, you can, do, you, do you realize that you can become addicted to stress physiologically? That it releases stuff in your body that you get to the point where you, are, you have become so used to stress that you dwell on it. You actually begin to boast about your stress. Beloved, it's time to slay the stress. It's time to worship the king of peace. And he's not, I'm not saying, you know, you're not going to have trial in life. I'm not saying your situations are hard. You're making a big deal. That's not, I'm not trying to minimize what we may be going through. I'm going through stuff, guys. I want you to know, like, it's a real battle. So trust me, I'm not trying to minimize anything. Do you know I read a stat the other day that over 85% of pastors, that, that uh, people that are pastors, quit pastoring in the first six years because they cannot handle the stress or the abuse that they sometimes get. Yeah, there is such a thing as pastoral abuse. <laughs> it is real. But beloved, God doesn't look at me and say, well, I understand you're stressed, so you can go ahead and just be stressed out. Neither does he say that to you, whatever stresses you're going through. God says, I need you. I need you to submit to the king of peace. Stop borrowing stuff that doesn't belong to you. That's not yours. And that's not, but Lord, it's my problem. No, it's not yours. I bought that for you on the cross. I bought that from you on the cross. 
So I'm going to ask, as I'm, um, Darren, please. Darren's going to come and lead us in prayer. And I'm going to ask, I'm going to make a simple appeal. Raise your hand if you have been a slave to stress. Be honest. Just be honest. Don't put on the, you know, I am holy look on your face right now. Be honest. If, if you haven't, then praise God. But if you have been a slave to stress, you have, you have suffered at the hand of these nine kings of emotional stress. And you're saying, Lord, no more. No more. I'm going to submit. I'm going to give these to you. And it is my desire to live under the king of peace. If that's your desire, I want you to raise your hands. The Lord sees your hands. I want to invite you to kneel as Darren leads us in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we uh, come to you this Sabbath. We lift our hearts to you. We thank you, Lord, for giving us this day that we can come to worship. I ask you to um, take anything in our lives that is separating us from you, this, the stress of life, the cares of life, Lord, that get in the way that, that we can, that steals our peace from us, Lord. I, have, I ask you to, um, in a special way, bless each one of us here today, Lord, as we come and worship you and help us to have a blessed day the rest of this afternoon in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I want to invite you all to stand as we sing our closing song.